Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David of the Edmonton Journal. And I'd like to welcome Oilers fans in oil country and around the world. I'd also like to welcome my colleague and friend, Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Well, I'm doing okay. I, I thought it was actually a pretty good effort from the Oilers, uh, considering it felt like a scheduled loss night. You know, they're, you know, uh, come playing Friday night, traveling to Vancouver, um, four wins in a row. Um, so it, it was a, it was a pretty tough game to, to head into. And I thought the Oilers could have easily won this game. Um, they outchanced Vancouver slightly in the game. Probably about four. You know, we don't have our final official count. You haven't yet gone over it, but it looked like about fourteen grade A chances for the orders and eleven for Vancouver. Kind of depends how many chances grade A chances against you count on that big scrum uh, on um, Vancouver's first goal. Uh, we'll have to go over that and and take a hard look at that again. But I thought the orders played fairly well, and and um, if yes, a pulley RV had had figured out. You know, if that at the right at the end of the second period he had that fantastic chance to score. It was a bang bang player, so I'm not blaming him for not cashing in. But if he had scored that goal with um, the score tied one one at the end of the second, I think the Oilers would have been able to hang on and win this thing. But um, not to be Bruce, not to be. How are you? You're not so good. Well, I'm kind of bummed, but yeah. So it is. I mean, it was uh, one of those games where uh, you know, like say schedule loss. I expected Vancouver to play well, and they did for the most part. You know, they. Uh, they're in a desperate uh, situation now, and they're coming off a stinging loss in their last game and a stinging sweep at the hand of the Oilers recently. So they had a burr in their saddle, and and uh, they had a red-hot goaltender who uh, was able to stop the shots that he saw and have a bunch of ones that he didn't see, and his defense was diving and sprawling in front of uh, uh, shots in front of him all night long. So they... Uh, um, were able to hang on to that 2-1 lead by, by their fingernails down the stretch. I really thought when the Oilers got to 6-on-4, they should be able to tie it, but they just couldn't beat Thatcher Demko. A couple massive shot blocks on dry settle seemed to me mm-hmm. right at the end of the game. Uh, I don't think those yep. two, I think he took two kind of <laughs> shots right in his wheelhouse, and I don't think either got through to the goalie. So, and one for sure got, well, I thought it was an open net, like we almost should count it as a chance because I don't think Demko would have stopped it, but the D man in front of him got it. Yeah, you, so. could, you could look at I had a bad feeling about tonight, Bruce, when I looked mm-hmm. at the scoreboard. Me too. And I saw the Jets had beat the Leafs, and mm-hmm. um, the, the Flames had beat the Canadians, and there was no Batman point. So kind of everything had gone on a certain level, the Oilers' way, um, and they could have caught up to Toronto here, and it just was too good to be true. So <laughs> that was that was my first sinking mm-hmm. feeling. So Bruce, we'll do a we'll uh, you got a you've got the you've got the unenviable task of writing of game I grades do. tonight. So <laughs> we will <laughs> we will write we will not dwell on this too long. We'll just do two good things, two bad things, and two numbers. Be, no, we're not going to give you do two bad things each because it wasn't that terrible. It wasn't a, a stinker of a game by any means. It was a good game. It was exciting it was and tough. Close. Yeah, uh, it's a tough loss. Initial game. So what's your uh what's your good thing, Bruce? I'll start with my good thing because it sure. starts off the game, okay? I think it sets yeah, it up. Do it. I I you know, I, I was expecting Oilers to be a little tired and to Vancouver to be well rested, but Edmonton just came out firing. And according to our count, at least in the first period, Bruce, they had six grade-A chances to one for Vancouver. This was mainly the top line in the orders that was was uh, playing so well. But what impressed me in the first period with the Oilers, and it's it's hit me over the head a few times this year, is the team's passing. Can these guys ever pass that puck? And especially compared to, like, you know, we, we fresh in our memory uh, of Oilers fans is the decade of darkness. And the kind of inept puck moving we had from so many defensemen in that era, it was just so, it was painful to, to watch the Oilers try to advance the puck. That is not the case with this group of players. They really throw the puck around well. Um, and even players who formerly might have bobbled the puck, like Jujar Kara, is moving the puck really well tonight, or all in the last month. 
making good decisions. Making so good it's, I just see it as a team wide aspect of this team is that they're they're really getting tight with their passing, and uh, it's why they've been a good team so far this year. It's one of the reasons, and it bodes well for the future. They can really move that move the seed. Would have been nice to see a pass get through on one of those two on one. So, oh Jesus. Two wide open, two on one, zero shots because zero yeah. passes were able to reach the target. He should have shot on the one of them. Drysaddle should have definitely shot on the one of them. Yep. I think it, it might have been the one with McDavid. It, it was one with, with was with Nugent Hopkins, right? And one was with McDavid. Any any uh, yeah, he didn't shoot on either of them. When you're the one was Yamamoto. One was was I mean those were two of the cleanest chances they had all night. So. Hurts not to even get a shot. It would have been nice. And I'm sure mm. that if he could do it again, he would be shooting on those plays. Um, but he is, I mean, he should have taken, he should have, he, like, I don't know, the second time, it's just like, why, why did you do that? All right, Bruce, what's your good thing? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go with the one Leon shot that, <clears throat> that, did find the back of the net to tie the score at one to one. And already it seemed like Thatcher Demko had built a wall in front of the net and the, and the Oilers had <clears throat> overlapping power play. So they had a two man advantage for 23 seconds. And uh, uh, that guy, first guy got out of the box, but the pressure stayed on. Vancouver guy was without a stick. And finally a uh, pass came over to Leon before Demko had a chance to get over there and he just rocketed one into the top of the net. I'm going to my TV, stop that! You know, <laughs> this minutes after the, the extremely dubious goal that Vancouver got to open the scoring, which we'll be talking about shortly, but uh, uh, fairly tied the score, which the Oilers deserved to be tied at the end of the second. And honestly, David, I was just hoping they would get a result, get this game to the 60-minute mark, and then see what happens. Get a loser point. Yeah. I mean, they've they played 30 games this year, and there's been one extra point given out. It's really costing them this stupid, crappy standing system that the NHL devised and never fixed for 20 years. It's... Yeah, I... Uh... <laughs> I, well, let's just go back to Dry Settle's goal, which was yeah. a good thing here, Bruce. Sure. Uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I love that pass from Nuge. It was just such a mm -hmm. calm. Uh, he got the pass in the slot from McDavid. And and Nurse had started it all off for making a really nice stop of the puck at the blue line. Yeah. And um, But Nuge's pass was just so calm, right on the money, right at the, the right pace. And man, did Dry Settle hammer that puck. <clears throat> that was a beautiful goal. So, uh, and, and I love <laughs> John Garrett's such a homer, right? He's such a Vancouver homer, if you ask me. And yep. and he just his little his bitter little uh, comment after that. Well, Travis Hamanek had broken his stick. You yeah. know, he was just kind of disgusted that this bad luck had befallen his Canucks. But uh, I liked it <clears throat> a lot. And uh, great play by Leon Dreisaitl. Uh Bad things. Bruce, I'm going to start again with this bad thing because you, you had already brought it up. A and and we might disagree on, on this. I think we might disagree. But my bad thing is I think the ref got made the right call in allowing that goal. I don't think that they ever stopped. No one ever stopped that puck. It was never secure under anyone or under Koskin, and it was always bouncing around. It was always loose. The ref was right there. He was looking at it. And as much as I hate to say that, and I know that there's going to be lots of Oilers fans who will disagree with me, but I think the refs, technically at least, maybe not by the NHL quick whistle standard, but technically, and this is technically, they got that call right. It was never, it was always in play. It was never covered. It was a live puck, and they put it in the net. They put it in the net, or did they power it into the net? Like eventually, <clears throat> Koskinen. I thought the power it in the net. Koskinen's stick was back, and he made two or three saves with his paddle. And each time, it was closer to the goal line as they were just scrumming it forward. It was like a rugby play, right on the covered. you know one yard line. Hmm. It wasn't covered. Yeah, I guess I don't know, man. I don't know. I. I I tweeted out my one tweet of the game that I've been watching hockey since 1960, 
63. And I don't think I've ever seen a goal like that. Where the puck was in the blue paint for 10 seconds. And yet, it's loose. Nobody can do anything. Everybody's laying on the ice. The guys are getting shoved around left and right with uh, these sticks. And, um, I guess it's a good goal. All I could think of was 40 or 50 or 87 quick whistles that would have been called against the Oilers over the years after 0.01 seconds where, they, oh, I lost sight of the puck. You know. Anyway, so frustrating. I have two, two comments based on what you just said, Bruce, that uh, I, I have a, the feeling that the, the, the clipboards in your uh, study there are pretty nervous right now. And uh, my second thought, <laughs> my second thought is, it's a fair comment that usually you expect that play to get blown dead. And I agree with you. I don't remember a goal like that either. The Kessler goal where he grabbed uh, Talbot's pads was kind of long in the crease too, as I recall. Four seconds. Yeah. This was, I don't know if I've ever seen it. They always seem to call it. Yeah. That said... When I, when I watched the replay, and maybe I'll watch it again too, but when I, I, when I watched it a number of times, because I'm hoping to see some, something that I can complain about, I, I want to be able to bitch. And, I, and I'm hoping, well, first of all, I'm hoping that there's going to be something there that will disallow the goal, something you know tangible and real, and, and, then I, and, and I want to be able to complain uh, if they do allow it. But I can't because other than the fact that it did, does go against the norm, I think the puck was kind of bouncing around and never was covered, never was stopped. So there you have it. And the guys are uh, saying the refs didn't want to call the penalty shot. Well, if you think it's a penalty shot, call the penalty shot. If you think somebody covered it. But. Well, that could be right because people were trying to cover it with their hand and their arm and stuff. They should have, like, that might have dropped it dead too, like, yeah. All right. Bruce, Costner what is your... Is not a happy camper. No, if that was Mike Smith, they would have blown up. First of all, if that was Mike Smith, they would have blown the whistle, I think, Probably. I feel. Because, you know, what would they tell Mike? There's yeah. and there's veteran, NHL veterans that intimidate, like that are more, yeah. have more cachet and more intimidation factor and have been around the league longer. And I just think if Mike Smith had been in that, they would have blown that dead. And if they hadn't, he would have gone ballistic. Mm -hmm. But Koskinen's the nice Scandinavian fellow and uh, wasn't too happy. He played a good game. Nord, 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 Nordic fellow. Finland, Finland isn't Scandinavian, but it's the whole region is Nordic. It's kind of like Newfoundland and the Maritime provinces. No, nope, it's not. It's, why it's a, one of the Nordic countries. It's, it's a fine distinction, but any Finn will tell you. <laughs> sure. Get it's like it. any Newfoundlander will tell you. Newfoundland's not part of the Maritime provinces. It's part of the Atlantic provinces. It's just Scandinavia. Yeah. Yeah. So Scandinavia is uh, uh, Sweden and Denmark, Norway, Iceland. You know, is, it, is it the former Viking countries? Like strong historical, cultural, linguistic ties. Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. I didn't know that, um, or or more broadly, to include the Island Islands, the Faroe Islands, right. Finland, and Iceland. This is according to Wikipedia. Finland, Bruce. okay. You say Finland. All right. But, well, look uh, at the look at the names and look at the names of the Finns compared to any of those other countries. Okay, and here's the very different. Encyclopedia Britannica says some authorities argue for the inclusion of Finland on geologic and economic grounds. So I'm going to say that's kind of weak. I'll, I'll go with your, I'll go with right. your take. Uh, what's your bad thing? Well, in a game that came down to three stinking goals, two for Vancouver, one for Edmonton, I'm going to pick the game-winning goal by Vancouver and a, a defensive breakdown where the Oilers, for the several of the time in the third period, were unable to move the board. So they lost some battles. And in this particular case, uh, uh, Devin Shore, the left winger, came all the way over to the right wing boards where he proceeded to lose the battle. That the puck went back to the point, and Patrick Russell, the right winger, was kind of stuck in the middle of the ice. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Like he really should have been playing the left winger spot. And when the point-to-point -point pass came over, 
uh, Russell was way out of the lane, and that when he tried to get over there, and he realized Myers was had the angle on him, he almost it looked like he just said, "I'm not going to get this," and he didn't like try and dive in front of the shot or anything. And Myers wound up with a what 30 foot slap shot, 35 foot slap shot, and he just hammered it. And there was just nobody covering the guy, and you know that. That line's job is to make sure that nothing dangerous happens when they're on the ice. And they did it most of the night. They were pounding the end boards at the other end and shooting it in and scrumming things up and, you know, making making uh, things happen. But, yeah, 34-foot slap shot. And, you know, Tyler Myers, a lot of leverage in that guy. We've seen him do that before. Yeah. And um, just as he sh- wound up to shoot, mm-hmm. Ethan Bear skated in front of Koskinen and just as he fired the puck actually Ethan Bear John Garrett was insisting that Nico Koskinen had a good view of that no I don't think so he was down now you might blame him for being down and not like um trying to see the puck better but he he was looking and and uh Bear skated right in front of him screened him Bear was trying to cover a player who who was had gone in front of the Oilers goalie and uh screened Miko Koskinen and it went in Pretty tough play for the goalie. And, uh, yeah, Russell, you just can't have that where you're allowing these defensemen with great shots to just come in like that and wire it. I mean, mm-hmm. bad things are usually going to happen very often. So, And it did. And it did. It did, Gandalf. It did. All right. Bruce, what is your number? Uh, my number is 911. And that is the number of shot attempts, nine, that Vancouver was credited for in 11 seconds around that scrum. And again, I'll say I've never seen the like, but it was just uh, uh, it was just one thing after another. Just a second here. Let me find it again. Nine yeah. shot. But they were what? Nine what? shot attempts oh, in 11 just, se- seconds. That's just ridiculous. Besser's shot was blocked by Bear. Uh, Miller's slap shot from 37 feet was on goal, and that's where the chaos ensued. This, mm-hmm. this was at uh, 7:12 and 7:11 on the clock. Then at 7:10, uh, Pearson was credited with a four-foot shot. At 7:08, Pearson was cr- credited with a five-foot shot. Then there was three blocks by Edmonton at 7:07, 7:06, and 7:06. Two by Bear and one by Archibald. Then at 7:04. Horvat was credited with a five-foot shot. And then at 7.01, three seconds later that they're still not blowing the bloody whistle, uh, Horvat's credited with a three-foot shot on the goal, which was more like three inches, actually. But the puck was just in the blue paint, and they were just whacking away at it. Now all of these shots are getting counted. Like I say, nine shot attempts in 11 seconds. So I guess those are one my, way those to are look my at numbers. it. So I look for unusual things for numbers, and that's pretty bloody unusual. Maybe maybe that's the, <laughs> maybe they were right. I don't know. Like it looked to me more like battling, you know. But they're of course in their battling. There, it's like a rugby scrum. The Knucks are standing up, and the Oilers are all laying down, and that was the yeah. big reason they all lost that battle. I didn't really see shot. I don't know. I saw people jamming at the puck, but not. I don't know. Shots. I don't. I saw a couple shots in there. I think Koski made some paddle stops in there where they were jamming, and he kept making these saves. There was one angle that showed him. Anyway, I think that's a play for further study. For now, I'm just going to gross about it. Did they have an overhead view of that? I don't remember seeing in in like a right over the goalie view of it. I'm not, I can't remember. I don't think they did. That would be good to see if they have a, an overhead view. They probably didn't show it because it would have shown that it shouldn't be a goal. (laughs) Uh, the orders didn't challenge. The orders no. didn't challenge it. That's all I'm saying. Uh, my number, Bruce, is 11 out of 14. The Oilers had 14 grade A chances. Of that, I'm certain. Mm-hmm. Um, not certain about Vancouver's total at this point. No. But um, Connor McDavid was in on 11 of them, Bruce. Oh. He was in on 11 of 14. Now, that could be a really good thing or a really kind of bad thing. But it does, the owners have really stacked one line. And the, the three other lines played, I thought, fairly well tonight. Um, I didn't have a 
problem with any one of them. But um, they're stacking that top line, and uh, they came close to scoring many times during the game, but it just didn't click for them, except on the one power play. But uh, McDavid, he was he's just... His offensive game is at a different level. I, I this year, Bruce, he um, there just seems to be a certain amount of quickness in his deking, where he's going around players more easily. And um, this leads to a topic that I wrote a quick post on. We had um, uh, Christopher Stieg the other day talking about Connor McDavid and his, and his ability. And he was complaining about the constant fouling that was going on. And Chris, here's what Christopher Versteeg said. And I will, will say, I'll say that first before we get into Kevin Bieksa's response. But Versteeg said, could you imagine if they called the game right? Our superstars will never be able to be superstars until they call the game right. This garbage can't happen. And here he's referring to Ottawa Senators late fouls on McDavid. Mm-hmm. These guys are supposed to put on a show every night. And if our league is not giving our superstars the ability to do this each and every single night, then why? Why? So yeah, start calling it right. Start impressed. protecting our stars. This is the time now to do it. This guy is the best player we've seen since Gretzky. He's unbelievable. Take care of him. So that was the sane and rational view of Chris Versteeg, um, who understands the importance of of superstar hockey players to the NHL, even if the NHL itself is dull uh, and does not understand this issue. And I thought Kevin Bieksa kind of encapsulated the nonsensical NHL position on it, which he he articulated um, between periods tonight. And they were showing some fouls on McDavid that, that, um, that uh, weren't called. Mm-hmm. And he, here's what Bieksa said. Contrary to what Chris Versteeg said a couple days ago about how nobody in the NHL um, should be allowed to touch him. I just add that in to my post here. Should be allowed to touch him. Um, and Versteeg didn't say that. He was talking about that the ref's not calling him. I think you have to do this kind of stuff. You got to try to take runs at him. You got to try to slow him down. If you don't, and you don't get these little clips on him here, He's going to embarrass you. He's going to go end to end. He's going to go around everybody. And you have to get a piece of him whether wherever you can, all over the ice. And while Edmonton Oilers fans are probably sitting there right now saying, oh, Bieksa says that everybody has got to take runs at McDavid. Of course I'm not saying that. Smarten up. So he actually did say everyone should take runs at McDavid, and then he said he didn't say it. So I'm not exactly clear what he's saying. Uh, he, he never addressed at all uh, Versteeg's point that all Versteeg is saying when, when there's illegal hits and plays against McDavid, you should call those plays. He's not saying no one can hit him, but BX is, starts riffing on that and gives this confused response. But what it all adds up to is, is he's essentially BX is advocating players should be able to take cheap shots at McDavid. It's the only way players can, can, can hold their own against them and the ref should go easy on it. That's how, that's the gist of what I thought the yeah. was saying. And I just think it's, it's a, just, I just think it's a, it's a typical NHL attitude and it's a, it's rubbish and it's disgraceful. Who does he think he is? Colin Campbell? <laughs> well, he might be one day. Colin Campbell was kind of the Kevin Bieksa of his time. Mm-hmm. It's a player. I mean, this is, I remember him as an order in 1979-80. Greasy, and uh, he would do it, take pieces of players, and you know, I mean, he grew up with that old hard school that you know, don't give him anything for free. Take a piece of him every chance you get. And, yeah. I mean, McDavid, he took a few few pretty borderline shots tonight. I think they called one, and they let a few go. There was one obvious interference where the guy stepped in front of him, clipped him skate to skate. And I thought McDavid might have been hurt that time, but. It was, uh, anyway. I just want to, why I think this is just, why it's disgraceful, Bruce, is, is the rules are there for a reason. And yeah. just call the rule book. You yeah. know, the rules are the same for Kevin Bieksa when he was a player and Christopher Stieg and McDavid. No player should face constant abuse and have it go unpenalized. And it, just because you're a really good player doesn't make that right. And... Um, if you don't 
if you don't call it, then, you know, in theory, the law of the jungle starts to apply. Players take, oh, yeah. take, take, start to get chippy, take, take the law into their own hands on the ice. Now that's more heavily penalized in the NHL now than it used to be. You can't get away with that kind of Mark Messier smashing someone in the, in the face with your stick if they're checking you too tightly. But they, they still haven't come to grips with just calling fouls on, on players and star players. And I don't think anyone's asking for special treatment of Connor McDavid. Just all this late hit crap uh, that mm-hmm. we constantly see that Ottawa was engaging in. Uh, I didn't notice it as much tonight, but call those. You're gonna, he, he is going to get injured. You're going to be without him. Uh, um, is that what you want? Because that's where this leads, and I, that's why it's disgraceful. It's just it's unfair, and it, and it's dangerous to uh, the most important players in the NHL, players like McDavid, players like Bobby Orr and Mary Lemieux, you know, yeah, that were constantly harassed and, and hacked and and dived in front of and and wound up dealing with injuries for much of their career, or in particular, you know, they just uh, what whatever they could to stop that guy and leave and for the rest of their the lives job of protecting him either. Yeah. I mean, hockey is a tough, it's a tough enough game. Connor McDavid's going to get hit enough legally right. without, um, without, uh, the cheap shots that go unpenalized. So, you know, he actually didn't address the penalty issue at all. Right. He, he was, he seemed to go off on a tangent, but I just took it as him kind of condoning that. Like he did say he disagreed with, with, uh, for Stieg, So, and that's that was Versteeg's point. Like, like, call the penalty. So, yeah. Well, if they called every penalty that Kevin Bieksa committed in his career, he would have been out of the league a lot sooner than he was. So, I mean, it's pretty <laughs> yes. obvious which side he's going to come down on. He, he I, listen. He, I, I really admired him uh, on a certain level, like uh, as a player. Mm-hmm. Kevin Bieksa was a was a good, smart, s- successful, effective hockey player. But you are correct. He took a lot of professional fouls, as as you want to call them, and uh, as they're called. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to get into that little uh, subplot. Uh, that's, it, that uh, I wrote a post on it um, between the second and third periods. Oh, yeah. so, oh okay. So, I'll look yeah. for that and I'll promote it in my yeah. page when the time comes. Well, Bruce, let's leave it there. Yeah, we're going to lose an hour of sleep tonight, eh? Daylight yeah. savings time. Another one of my absolute favorite things kicks in tonight. So I'll be writing at two o'clock, and it'll suddenly be three o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I like daylight savings time half the time. Every yeah. fall, I really like it. Yeah, um, every yeah when we I get don't. the hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I don't have a. I, I'm kind of agnostic on it. I don't have a strong feeling about it. But uh, so Bruce, they play. Is it Monday? Monday in Calgary. Wednesday in Calgary. Then they come home Thursday with, again, a uh, um, back-to-back against Winnipeg, where they play Thursday and Saturday. And then without a break, they go all the way east to Montreal, where they play Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then on to Toronto on Saturday. So a third back-to-back with travel involved in a two-week span. So it's a, it's a particularly vicious schedule right now. It would have been nice to get a result from this game, man. It, it would have, to get a loser point so. even. Yeah, well, yeah, get one and take your shot. It's the second one. I would have been happy with even a one-point outcome. Right now, I'm a little bit sour. <laughs> I never would have guessed it, Bruce. I never yeah. would have guessed it. <laughs> yeah. What are you sour? People. Like, what? Are, what is the, the root of your sourness, would you say? Because uh, I don't think you've fully articulated it yet. Just just get it, let it go. Well, yeah, okay. Well, let's going to be another late night writing about another loss so that's just me being selfish about being tired of writing about losses and it just they haven't fallen my way this year i didn't do any of the ottawa games right <laughs> i totally get that i i totally get that oh, yeah i hate but have it like I, I remember i just hate that like you, you're the game's over and you got to sit there you got to write about this oh yeah I spent a bunch of time today writing about how the Oilers are tightened up defensively and how every time they give in two goals or less, they win 14 and 0 and 0 this year. Every game won in regulation, not even in, uh, not even in overtime. So of course, as soon as I write it, they go out, give up two, allow and score one. So much for that. And I feel like I jinxed them just for fun. I don't believe in jinxes, but it's just 
one of those things. And then they got that goal, and it winds up being the difference in a one-goal game. I thought it would be one nothing for a while, and that would be it. But anyway, I did. I, I hated that goal against too, but I felt there was a little justice when the Oilers got a power play and they scored right away. I thought, okay, got a little break yeah. here because I didn't think they were going to get one by Demko. He just looked so sharp. Yeah, he was. And then right. then they did, and I thought, oh well, maybe maybe we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Already burst by advice. Period. Once Vancouver scored, Edmonton was all over him, but they were all over him on the boards. They could never get the puck into the middle of the ice for a shot. They could keep it in Vancouver's end for shifts on end, but they could never work it off the boards and into anywhere where someone could shoot it. They finally got their first scoring chance with three minutes to go in the third period, and then they got three more with the you know the power play, the six on four. But, My only advice to you tonight is to just take it easy and be brief. You know, just, just, uh, just write a mark, give a, give a comment from, from memory, just, and just fire it out there, fire it out into the uh, universe and uh, people will accept, people, people will understand. That's what yeah, I'm I don't want to crap on the team because I don't think they played for it. I think they deserve better. And honestly, that's what I'm sourest about. Like I'm less sour when they get beat. And I, I don't really feel like they were the second best team in this game, but I think the word doesn't lie. I guess, and I guess that's conversely why I feel okay, because I thought the Oilers. I hate it yeah. when they, the, I hate it when they play poorly, but I thought they played fine, and and there was lots to like about that game, and l- plenty to like about the Oilers' effort. So I'm left in a more optimistic mood, but then I can go watch TV now, and you have right. to write the game grades. <laughs> right, well, so. Enjoy, enjoy your TV, and don't forget to move your clock ahead. Yeah. It happens automatically now on our cell phones. Yeah, most, most clocks, yeah. All righty, Bruce. Thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. Grumble, grumble. <laughs>